Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Julian Stuhler. It's my pleasure to introduce the first of four webcasts that Tron Consulting uh, are running over the, the coming weeks. Uh, this one is a general overview of DB2 uh, for LEW version 11.1. Uh, we do have additional webcasts happening over the, the next three weeks, which I'll uh, give you some highlights of at the end of this session. Uh, but in the meantime, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, two guests uh, who will probably need very little introduction to this audience. Uh, George Backlars of IBM and Iqbal Gorawala of, of Triton. And uh, George is going to lead this session, uh, ably assisted by, by Iqbal. And I'll hand over now to George to kick off the session. Um, thanks, Julian. And uh, welcome, everyone, to this session. Uh, we're going to cover uh, DB2 version 11, uh, kind of an introduction to it, the overview, the packaging. Um, before I get started, maybe some words from Iqbal about uh, you know, what we're trying to do with these uh, series of presentations. Sure. Thanks, George. I mean, uh, welcome, everybody, again. Uh, just wanted to, first of all, thank George uh, for really taking time to uh, be with us on this series of webcasts. Uh, DB2 11 was announced in April, and in a couple of weeks, it's going to be GED. Uh, right now, George is in London. Actually, we are doing this thing, uh, this this particular session today, uh, live. Uh, so again, a big thank you to uh, George. So what we want to do in this webcast is we want to start today with a, uh, uh, as Julian said, an overview of of the new spanking release, uh, DB2 version 11, uh, and then we want to take some deep dives uh, into you know three different top topics, which you know Julian will talk about. I'll I'll mention as well towards the end. Uh, so you know you know, sort of start you off with an overview and then, you know, hopefully uh, get into some deep dive so that, you know, by the end of this four webcast, you know, you've got a good grip of 11.1 and, you know, uh, we all want you to start using it. So uh, I'll hand it over to George now and uh, to start the overview. Yeah, I like that, Iqbal. You said spanking release. Is that kind of a play way of saying kick ass? <laughs> um, anyway, um, let me first start there. I, Everything I'm going to present to you is, is uh, as far as I know, going to be G8 on June the 15th. Okay, so if there's a possibility that I have said something incorrectly, you can't hold it against me. All right, but uh, everything in this presentation is uh, what we plan to have uh, generally available and uh, available to you in a couple of weeks. So let me first talk about some of the uh, highlights of the release, and there's really five areas that we talk about. Um, of course, we're going to go into more details on these in the subsequent broadcast, but uh, we're going to give you kind of a highlight of these areas. The first one is what I call petabyte scale in memory warehousing. So many of you are probably aware of the blue technology in DB2, the columnar in memory technology. It gives a great performance for analytics, for mining, um, but it was restricted to one single large image. So basically, the biggest SMP box is as big as our blue technology could take you. So in this release, what we've done is now added... Uh, blue capability to DPF or partitioning. So now I can have a cluster of machines, each running a portion of the database, all within columnar technology. So this is a great uh, enhancement for those customers for ultra-large warehouse requirements. Um, we're also doing something called broader analytical horizons. And basically what we're doing is adding a whole bunch of new um, SQL instructions into uh, DB2. A lot of them are statistical and analytical functions for people who like to play with SQL and you know, do statistics, um, plus a bunch of stuff that will help from a migration point of view from a variety of platforms, including NetPisa. So we're going to touch upon that today, but we'll have, a, you know, a larger session on SQL. Um, in terms of data protection, we're enhancing both our encryption capability and the different DB2 environments that you're allowed to use it on. So um, stay tuned on that one, because I think this is important for all customers. Um, transactions. We've done some things to enhance the amount of throughput in DB2. So again, we'll show you some graphs on that. Uh, basically, things you don't have to do. We've buried a lot of these enhancements in the engine, so there's no settings that you have to change. But you'll see some significant performance benefits, especially in high-performance workloads. And then finally, always their business. And this is our pure scale technology, which allows us to run a cluster of machines with a single database image. And if there's an outage of a particular member or a network for that member or whatever, we can continue running your workloads on a second server or a subsequent server. And in fact, what's interesting here is we're also going to give you some of this capability in all of the DB2 editions. So let's first take a look at the overall announcement information. We announced on April the 12th, DB2 version 11, and Electronic GA is on June the 15th. Um, at the same time, we announced end of marketing. 
for version 10.5. So end of marketing occurs end of September 30th, 2016. So that's all DB2 additions and features. Um, you know, in fact, some of you may have encryption offering or business continuity offering. Um, if you have those things, they'll be kind of migrated to the version 11 packaging. And then finally, probably the most important one for many people is that we're announcing end of service for both version 9.7 and 10.1. Both of those will go out of service at the end of September 30th, 2017. So that means if you're on either of those old versions, you're going to have to look at migrating to the newest version or implementing or paying for extended service. Um, if any of you are running SAP workloads, it doesn't matter because they have extended contracts out to 2025. Hey, George, I, I've, got a, I've got a quick question here. I mean, what's, what's really the difference between end of marketing and end of service? I mean, you, there's quite a confusion in these two terms. So if you could just explain that for the audience, please. Yeah, sure. End of marketing means that um, uh, an IBM sales rep, and I'm sure you see them all the time, um, can't sell you 10.5 after September 30th. So basically, okay. you won't be able to buy it from us. Okay. But as a customer, you can still get 10.5. You know, we're not we haven't ended service or anything like that. So you can still get the code. Right. It's just that we won't sell it to you anymore. We'll sell you version 11. Okay. okay? And there's some disadvantages and advantages to that. So when we talk about packaging, you'll see what the differences are. Right. A uh, so follow-on question I had is usually, you know, and it's it's quite unusual to have end of service for two versions on the same date. I mean, what 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 was what was the thought behind that, if if any? Um, did I tell you you weren't supposed to ask controversial <laughs> questions on these webcasts? Um, anyway, um, yeah, so both 9.7, as you know, I, okay, let's back up a little bit. Our typical philosophy in the past has been about five years right. for the versions, right? And um, so 9.7 is well beyond that, okay, yes, from definitely. when it was first introduced. And 10.1 yeah. actually will hit its five years right. uh, in, in that date. Okay. Okay. So it's not unusual. Yeah. I think what's unusual is that both of them are being done at the same time. Okay. And um, you know, honestly, one of the things we did with this release is allowed migrations directly now from nine seven or ten one or ten five to eleven. Right. So I know in the past we had we avoided you know the, the two version yes. upgrades. Yes. Yes. Um, so we felt at this time it'd be best to not have people move to ten one. Like if we didn't announce the ten one end of service, there's always a possibility somebody would migrate to 10.1 and then be hit with something, let's say, 6 to 12 months afterwards with an end of service. Yeah. So I know for some customers it would cause, it will cause some, some grief, I guess, you know, depending on the number of databases they have. But yeah. we think the, the best way forward is to go to 10.5 or to 11 if you can do it. Yeah, I, right. think, I, think, I think that's very clever because, you know, it will definitely, I mean, for about 9.7 customers, you know, being... being, being uh, allowed to just do a one hop migration or a one hop upgrade i think i think that'll come as a pleasant surprise yeah so it's, yeah. i think i think it's a good thing yeah, definitely we've, we've tried to make it easier um, the other thing to know too is that a lot of people wait till fix pack 1 or 2 or 7 or whatever before they're comfortable <laughs> migrating that's correct yeah. um, a lot of the code that you see in db211 has actually been running in our dash db product so if people are not aware of that dash db is the db2 version sitting in the cloud okay um, yeah so i think i think i think uh, I was at Ida Austin uh, last week, and and I think this is uh, a message that was being uh, repeatedly uh, being being said by 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 the IBM uh, speakers uh, that one one very special thing about uh, version 11 on premise is that the code the actual code has been out there on Dash DB on the cloud for the past nine months. Is it nine months? Yeah. Nine months. So you know there have been customers using it. Uh, there have been incremental changes and fixes and everything. So uh, really, uh, this time the GA. If you wish, everybody gets scared, as you mentioned, you know, about going to the GA release. But you have to remember that this particular GA release has been out there, being tested and tried and you know fixed for the past nine months. So that I'm hoping, you know, for customers out there, that'll increase their confidence level of moving to 11, like sooner than later. Right. Yeah. Uh, sure. You know. On the other hand, customers will say, "Well, you mean I've been testing this version in the in the cloud for the last nine months for you?" Yes, you have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so I mentioned some packaging changes, and again, here's some things you need to be aware of. Um, the first one is that if you have a copy of DB2 Express Edition, so not the free one, Express C still exists, okay, so that's our free community edition of right. DB2, yeah. and available to everybody to download and use without any kind of warranty, right? Yeah. But Express Edition is, is going away as, as part of version 11, and we're going to fold that into Workgroup Edition. So that means any, you know, 
going forward, you can only buy workgroup server edition. Well, on the other hand, what we've done is we've added a bunch of new capabilities into workgroup edition okay. that, that were not available in Express and also reduced the price quite significantly. All right. So the, what you see on the chart here, these are U.S. prices, and there's no way of translating U.S. prices to British pounds. As you know, it's probably dollars for pounds, <laughs> right? But but in any case, you can yes. see that the original price, if you're, if you're charging based on a, let's say, a user basis, is $544, goes down to 354 right? So it's, yeah. it's a significant reduction. So we feel that it's, it's a lot of benefit in this release. Okay. That's, that's, that's really exceptional. So are you saying that, you know, if I'm an Express Edition customer, I can, you know, basically migrate to work group server edition so what does it mean kind of for me because as we know as we all know express has got its resource limits in terms of the number of cores and memory does this mean as a customer that i will be now upgraded if you wish you know your flight upgrade kind of thing yeah or, you know, yeah it's, more leg room or <laughs> yeah that's a good question i mean it's one of those really unusual situations in ibm where you're actually going to get more capability um <laughs> rather than less but Yoo-hoo! what it means is that if you have an express edition license you will be migrated to version 11, okay, workgroup server license. Okay. Okay. Now, what that means, by the way, is that if, if you're on 10.5, the restrictions remain in place, right? If when you migrate your system to version 11, yes. right, you're now under the version 11 licensing terms, which means now you're entitled to workgroup. Right. Okay. So okay. that's the thing to remember. Okay. Um, now, what does that mean? So workgroup and enterprise edition now include, as part of them, the pure scale standby option, and we're going to show some slides on what that means. Yeah. Uh, table partitioning encryption is included. Okay. Yeah. So again, I'll explain what that means by encryption. Multi-dimensional clustering and federation now wow. is is included. Now, we had federation before, but it, there's some extensions to it, right? But basically, federation for DB2 and Phonics databases. Yes. Um, you can't. So in those two versions, so workgroup and enterprise cannot do data partitioning, so that's DPF, right? Yeah. Um, can't do the SQL warehousing, the blue acceleration, compression, MQTs, uh, CDC replication. So those restrictions are still in place, okay? Sure. You can't use those. Okay. If any of those things are required, you're going to have to look at the advanced versions. And here's the thing that changes for an Express customer. Workgroup's limits are 16 cores and 128 gigabyte of memory right. and unlimited database size. Where there were limits on Express before, right? Yeah, I think yeah. it was eight cores and yeah. uh, much less memory. Yes. So you're basically getting twice the number of cores, twice the amount of memory, and no database limit in this release. That's that's just fantastic. I mean, I think if I was an Express customer, I would be really seriously thinking about moving to Workgroup Server Edition. I would, you know, to 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 DB2 level. Well, I, I wouldn't buy it now. I just buy my Express and then wait for it to be <laughs> upgraded. You know. But um, don't, I, I didn't say that. No. Okay. Um, and then if you want all the features, so basically every feature we have for DB2 is included in the advanced workgroup and the advanced enterprise work right. edition. Okay. okay. So that, that's still true. Now here's something brand new. It's called D, DB2 Direct Editions. And these are a, a new way of delivering DB2 licenses for what I call uh, cloud deployments. And that could be whether the cl- it's really in the cloud or it's on premise. And we talk about something called a virtual processor core. A virtual processor core is what the um, cloud tells you you have. So, example, if I went to SoftLayer or to Amazon or you know or to Azure, right? right. What ends up happening is it's, you're told that here's your virtual machine and you're given two cores. Yeah. But they're virtual cores. You don't know if they're threads. You don't know if they're physical cores. But all I know is I've got two cores, right? Perfect. And so I license these virtual cores that are given to me. So the price is, is very reasonable. As you can see, there's two prices shown here. One is for standard edition and one for advanced edition. Yeah. So what standard is, is basically the workgroup server edition, all the capabilities that's in that. And the advanced edition is, is similar to advanced enterprise server edition. So you get everything. Right. And these are monthly charges. So we need a minimum of two cores. Yeah. So you can see a standard edition will be 270 US dollars right, uh, per month. That's it. And that includes all the capabilities. That's the service support, right? just like a regular DB2 license, except you're paying monthly. So for a customer who wants to do something in the cloud, you know, you want to deploy a QA mm-hmm. system, a test system, even yeah. production, right? and then you just pay us monthly. Um, as soon as you stop paying, poof, the license disappears. So it's not a perpetual license. It's just as long as you keep paying monthly. Right. right. So this is for customers who have, you know, small known 
you know, time scaled projects, is it? Or what are the other I mean that's where I see scenarios. most popular. Okay. Right, right. You know, we can debate about what cloud's good for, right? Yeah. But you know, in many cases people just want to spin up a quick system sure. and try out something, right? We sometimes see that for warehousing, right? Yeah. We want to do some analytics. And um, by the way, it's not restricted to um, you know, external cloud deployments. This is this will work internally too. Yeah. So let's say you want to create a virtual machine and you've got a, a you know a Linux box that's got sixty four cores on it, you know, so it's a big monster. Yeah. Um, and you can say, well, I'm going to use two cores for my VM session. And so what you do is you pay me for the two cores using this licensing. And I don't care what the hardware is, by the way. This could be a power box. This could be a, you know, an x86 box. Uh, it could be local. It could be in the cloud. It's the same pricing metric. Um, so very simple to understand, right? A monthly charge and, and off you go. The, the only thing you need to be aware of is if you go to the direct editions, there's a very... Um, there's two, two different maintenance streams for these direct editions. One is a fixes only stream, and then there is a fix plus new functionality stream. So right. it occasionally we'll add new features and functions. And there's a two-year window. So what we do is we expect that within every you know, certain period of time that you will apply the maintenance. So we're expecting you to apply the, apply the maintenance within the two-year window. Right. Otherwise, we won't allow you to continue with that license. We're trying to keep people up to date within a two-year window. Okay. okay. So that's one of the restrictions of this. Makes sense, though, I think. Uh, but, but it makes it very, very simple for someone who wants to start a project without the capital outlay, right? I go find a soft layer server, an Amazon server, start it up, put the license on there, install DB2, and away you go, yeah. right? I think, I think, I think this was. I mean, I've been asked by several customers in the past. You know, does does DB2 have a you know per you know per per week per day license or per yeah. month license or whatever? Yeah. Uh, you know. You know, for people to test DB2 and try it out, and if it's fit for purposes and everything, and I think this would be a, really a welcome for those kind of customers. You know. Yeah, it's great for cloud deployments, and like I said, it, does, it doesn't have to be uh, remote; it could be local. The other thing people need to really realize too that we're only charging up to the maximum capacity of the box. So an example would be um, on on the laptop that I'm running; it has two cores, yeah. but it's it's two, two threads per core, right? Yeah. So if I created a virtual machine. The virtual machine could see as many as four cores, right? Yes. Um, but you never have to pay more than the physical cores on the machine. So in this case, my licensing would be two, right? It wouldn't be the four that my virtual machine sees. Yeah. So it's another thing to re to realize. So 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 again, you know, you mentioned you know that you know you've got your power box and let's say it's got sixteen cores, and you only want to pay for four cores. Yeah. So in that sense, the license is just is it going to be like just like the express edition where you know a DB two you know sort of. Uh, just uses the cores it's licensed for? Yeah, it'll be licensed to the maximum number of cores. So right. for instance, the standard edition of this would go up to 16 cores. Right. Right. Now the thing, again, you've got to be careful because on, 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 um, on power boxes, you know, we can make it look like you know, uh, 16 cores and I'm only using two actual cores, right, because that's MT8. That's right. Right. So you, you should only be paying for two cores. Yes. Right? That's so, what I that's what so, I'm asking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The problem is for many of these virtualized systems, you don't know what the actual hardware is behind it. Mm. Right? So that's why this makes it very simple for licensing licensing, but you just gotta make sure you're not exceeding the number the physical capacity of the machine. It, you're just paying too much. Okay. I mean we as IBM don't mind, right? But you shouldn't be paying <laughs> more money, right? Absolutely. Um, so anyway, Absolutely. so these these are some significant changes people should be aware of. Right? Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Okay, so I mentioned some things were included, so let's uh, go through some of those. The first one is federation. We've had federation in and out and in and out and in and out of DB2 three times now. Um, what's happening in this release is federation now is included entirely in the engine, so there's no longer you know, the need to install a separate package, right? So for all the additions of DB2, uh, so this is a work group, advanced work group, uh, you'll have federation for both DB2 and Informix built in, okay? So no additional charge for that. If you had the advanced versions of DB2, the so advanced work group or advanced enterprise, you also include all of the uh, what we call wrappers or adapters for Oracle, Netiza, Teradata, Spark, Hadoop, you know, Hive and Pala. You know, so all of these open data sources now, you can look at them just like they were SQL databases. Um, so that's now included in the packaging. Okay, so what, what, this is interesting because what you're saying, are you implying that this is now the end of line for the Infosphere Federation Server product? Um, yes, so any customer who's got Infosphere Federation Server, their next version would be DB2 version 11. So we would do the same kind of license movement over to version 11 for them. That's quite a good deal, I think. Uh, yeah, it could be, yes. 
Yeah, so they get DB2, full DB2, but yeah. all the wrappers and everything. All the wrappers so, yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, it's interesting. Okay. okay. Because, you know, so it used to be a separate install and, you know, things like that, right? So right. It's, it's now just, just a DB2 install. Basically. It's just a DB2 install. So we've made that a bit simpler. Okay. Um, the next one is encryption. And uh, this is a good feature that everybody will have on every edition of DB2. So whether it's the work group or the enterprise editions, you're going to get encryption included. So by encryption, we mean that we encrypt the database, the log files, the backups, the temp files, the dump files, anything that contains data in it will be encrypted. Wow. Okay. Okay. Now, of course, you, you have to turn this on, right? Yeah. But the thing is, it's now base part of the product. We feel it's that important that you need to have this included. Um, you can have four types of encryption. You can have AES, right, so Advanced Encryption Standard, 128, 192, or 256-bit encryption, yeah. or you can use triple DES which is 168-bit, and there's three forms now of how you keep the key management. Uh, 10.5 did something called local key management, um, and that's still available, or you can use something called a centralized key manager. So this is in IBM's products, it's ISKLM, or any key manager that understands the KMIP 1.1 protocol. So this is basically a central site key manager. Yeah. And we've also done something called a technology preview. So what this means is that We've put it in the code for people to try it, but we haven't made it generally available yet. Yeah. So this is one of those features you need to be aware that's going to be a future fix pack before it's fully GA'd. Right. Okay. Like what this is, uh, it's called HSM, which is a um, hardware security module. So it's basically, rather than using software to do key management, it's a hardware box that nobody can you know, access, basically. And right. It's a hardware you know, keeping of the keys. Right. Um, so lots of options of how you manage your keys. But uh, this is included in all the versions, no additional charge, right? And something I think sh people should be looking at. Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, okay. Now, question. Um, question that came in just on the uh, WSC. WSC here. Will WSC customers, a work group uh, edition customers, see ongoing maintenance support price drop as well? Well, if the uh, version 11 price drops for work group server edition, I'm assuming that the service and support charge will be a percentage of that. So uh, yes, you should probably see a price drop. Now, you know, I'll put that in asterisks because I haven't seen the final pricing book. But seeing that we're making a significant reduction in the workgroup server price, that I would assume that the maintenance would also be based on that. Okay. okay. Now, for those people, by the way, who are on like ELAs, you know, in large enterprise agreements, yeah. then those are those are different, right? Those are, those are different. So these are probably like we'd have to check each one. At, yeah, no, I think I think it's a that's a good uh, question, and uh, thank you Ian for asking the question. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Okay. So the next thing that's included now. Oops, I'm apologies there. I'm too fast with the uh, cursor. So pure scale is also included in all the additions. Um, now uh, let me explain uh, pure scale. Pure scale is our continuous availability solution. Yeah. So that means I have a cluster of machines all looking at the same database. Workloads can go across all of these machines, and you know if there's a failure of one machine, I can flip my workload to another. Right. What we've done is we've licensed the use of a second node or a second member and all the additions so that you could use it for uh, failover and for maintenance as well as any kind of administrative tasks. Okay? So it's a restricted version of PureScale. It's only two nodes, uh, but the second node is available for doing these types of things. I'll show you a slide with, th with that in a second. Sure. You know? So, I mean, now... Just, just, just before you, you know, you mentioned encryption, you mentioned federation, and you mentioned pure scale, and you said these are available in all editions. I just want to make sure that you know I've, I've heard you correctly. So you know, this is quite some, this is quite big, right? So if if I have workgroup server edition, right? I have so not the advanced edition, but workgroup server edition. Let's say I've got full federation, I've got encryption as you described it, and I've got pure scale. Not the full-fledged pure scale, but the one you're busy, you know, which you're showing on this slide here right now. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So if anybody's familiar with uh, HADR, right? That's kind of our failover, right? Yeah. Passive failover system. Uh, HADR requires that you um, license the second server at 100 PVUs, or in the virtual world, it would be one virtual core, right? Right. So in this model, what you would do is you'd have your second server, yes. you license one core, yeah. or 100 PVUs, and now you can use it as a failover. Standby system. Okay, and can okay. you use the TCP/IP sockets on that? Yeah, absolutely. So the next slide actually kind of gives you sure. a, a view of that. Okay. So here's an example of a two-node member. Okay. Um, if you're using advanced workgroup edition and advanced server edition, 
you can actually have up to 127 members. Okay? No one's been crazy enough to do that, but but uh, but you know, and you're licensing these all for things like scalability for large number of users, right? Yeah. This is this model is only for uh, continuous availability and for maintenance. Good. So what would happen is um, the primary member would do your workloads. So this is your normal DB2 work like, like you're doing today, right? So all your work would go to that one member. Yeah. The secondary member could be used for things like backups, run stats, monitoring, reorgs, you know, things that normally would interfere with your primary system. Yes. So now you can run the workload on a secondary member. And I don't care how big that is, by the way. You know, like the first system here is like uh, work groups limited up to 16 cores, right? Yes. So if I put 16 cores in there, I'm running all my workload. That could be an eight-core member. That could be a 16-core member. I don't care, right? right? I'm only licensing for one core. Yes. And I can run all of these workloads on it, right? So it's it's really useful. Absolutely. And in, in the event that that primary member goes down, all my work will be hot in the secondary because yes. it'll have access to all the locks. It'll have access to all the pages, yes. right? Um, so you've got a really high availability system, and you can combine this with HADR as well. Yes, right? uh, this is this is this is I, I, you know, having talked to various customers about pure scale and 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 the, and the uptake of pure scale, if you wish, over the past few years, I think this is a really interesting option for customers to really test pure scale and to you know take it on, especially customers who whose primary uh, objective or goal is availability. Yeah. Right, and especially if they don't have to go through, you know, the you know the RDMA sockets and you know all yeah. that stuff. I think this 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 is amazing. Basically, you've got an active active cluster here. Yes, you do. Yeah. And you're paying for only, you know, only one core for the second one, yeah. and being able to, you know, have your, you know, it's a, it's it's a ninety nine percent ninety nine point nine percent availability there. Yeah. See now, where the, if you want to contrast this to HADR, HADR, my second server can be local, like the example here, or it could be remote, right? That's right. Hundreds yeah. of miles away. Yeah. Um, the only problem is that that second machine is really only for failover. You yeah. could do some read only, yeah. but you can't do any of this administration. Yeah, it's quite restricted. Right. Yes. Whereas here I can do all the administration. If you actually wanted to do reads on this second member, you'd have to license the whole box. Right. Right. Okay. But but for administrative point of view, we don't care. We can just use the one core. That's, right? that's, that's really. And by the way, we're not just using one core. It's just the licensing is one core. Yeah. And, and, okay. and you know you you see that in in many, uh, you know all this uh, you know. Again, it's availability, but also in terms of you know doing your housekeeping, as you've yeah. seen on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. Usually, it's so difficult to do it on the production server, right? And here you've got a, the hot copy where you can actually be doing your house housekeeping, keep it in sync, yeah. and you know, best of all worlds, really. Right. Yeah. And by the way, you can still do the administrative stuff on the primary if you want. Okay. 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 So, okay. So a couple other things. This is more of operating system support that you need to be aware of. Um, you'll notice that some of them have been updated. Uh, we now support Power Linux Little Endian for pure scale, right? Uh, but you see it's a normal list of operating systems. The one that's missing that you don't see on here is Windows uh, 2016. Okay. Uh, once that becomes generally available, we'll also support that. Um, so if you're looking at migrating to version 11, make sure that your OS is also at the right level. Yeah, you know, absolutely. That's one, one thing somebody has to look at, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you can see there's a bunch of them there. So Hopefully, one of those operating systems is the one you're on, yeah. right? Um, also, lots of virtualization. Uh, so that's one thing that we support a lot of different options of how you want to do virtualization with DB2. And as you can see, there are all the different hypervisors for power, for you know, KVM, VMware. Uh, one thing people should notice is that we now support DB2 sitting in a Docker container for Linux. Right. Um, so that'll make things a little bit easier if you want to deploy in a development environment. You can create Docker images and just just you know attach Docker images and try stuff, right? Yeah. So another way of deploying DB2, and it's Linux only right now. Okay. Right? Uh, and then in Microsoft, you can see Hyper-V is supported, and also PureScale is also available on Power KVM VMware. Um, and uh, we've done some clever things with uh, PureScale as well from a virtualization point of view, which I'll cover. In our session on pure scale, yeah. um, in a couple weeks. Okay. Okay. Looking forward to it. Now I mentioned upgrade, and in this release, we're now allowing you to go from 9.7 directly to 11, so you don't have to do any intermediate hops. Um, so 10.1, 10.5 will also upgrade directly to 11.1. The other thing we've done is we've also changed the whole requirement for backups. Now, I mean, you're going to want a backup, right, before you do a migration of the database, but you don't have to do an offline backup. 
Um, so what we allow you to do, as long as you're on 10, this is only for 10.5, okay? So if you're on 10.5, fix pack 7, yeah. you'll be able to do an online backup. Well, you should anyway, right? And you're running your transactions. You stop the database. You do your uh, migration, and you restart it. Now it's version 11, yeah. right? And you keep going, and what you would probably do next is another online backup at some time. Yes. But let's say you haven't finished that online backup, and something goes wrong, Yes. right? And you want to recover. What you do is you you reinstall 10.5, it'll go through the logs, it'll stop and say, okay, you've just upgraded, put 11 back on, and it'll roll forward the transactions. Okay, so th you can recover through a version migration. Yes. Okay? So it's for those people that don't want to do an offline backup. Yeah. No, I think this is amazing because, uh, I mean, oh, for all this, you know, all these years and all these releases, you know, uh, just getting a window where you would, you know, you, you need to do an offline backup yeah. was a showstopper. Yeah, and still is a showstopper for some customers because they just don't have that window. Absolutely, yeah. And now you know, as long as, of course, as you said, they're on you know, ten five fixed pack seven. Mm -hmm. This gives them that you know, you know, you don't you know, you don't need a maintenance window. You don't need to do an offline backup, and you know, you can roll forward the log. So I yeah. think it, this is. Yeah, the thing is that the only window of where you may have to do this is if you have not yet completed another online backup of your system yes. while you've moved to version eleven, right? right. You know, but that should be hopefully a very short window. Yes. Right? Yes, absolutely. Um, the other thing that I think is actually really important is this new HADR um, migration as well. So if you are an HADR, yeah. um, you know the second server, your secondary, always had to be reinitialized when you did a, a version migration, right? Yes. yes. Uh, now you don't have to because HADR now recognizes that you did a version migration, yeah. right? So it just it allows you to, to have that secondary in sync. With the primary, I mean, you still have to upgrade the second site to 11.1. Yes. But once you've done that, it's already recognized that you've done um, the log file contains the fact that it's done the upgrade. Right. right? Um, so you don't have to reinitialize the entire database on the secondary. Okay. So okay. so so you don't need to do a backup restore on the secondary. No. On the secondary. No. no. Oh, that's okay. that's really awesome. Yeah. yeah. Now it's only really, yeah, the only one that can't do that is uh, you have to be in again 10.5 fixed pack seven, and you can't do it with pure scale yet. Okay. All right. So pure scale doesn't allow the HADR secondary yet to do that. Uh, so, excuse me, to do that refresh, um, but we're working on it. Okay, okay. that was what I was okay. going to ask you. Is yeah. that something we yeah. can expect in the future? Uh, okay. My personal opinion: <laughs> <laughs> any views expressed by the presenter are not reflective of IBM's corporate <laughs> policy. Okay, that's the end of the legal disclaimer. Anyways, right. yeah, so that is something definitely on our list of okay. things to do. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, pure scale. Since I mentioned that this is the new way of doing, or another way of doing continuous availability. You'll be happy to know the whole install process has been um, really simplified. Um, basically, we've gone uh, from a huge number of steps to set up PureScale to about 40 to 50% less questions and less setup information. And if you're using sockets, yes. it's so much simpler, right? It's just IP, right, talking between the nodes. If you're doing things like hardware communication for locking, that's RDMA or InfiniBand, there's still some more adapter stuff you have to do. Right. <coughs> but for simple you know, sockets, it's really easy. We can usually get one of these systems up and running in a couple hours. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. I, 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 I know that this this was a, a kind of a, a little bit of a pain, really, for some customers. You know, again, the uptake of pure scale. Uh -huh. It's just the whole complication. You know, you know when it was RDMA and the adapters and everything, the new network and and then and then the install. So people, I, I know people were actually resorting to the to the to the internal, you know, TSA hmm. commands and everything. Oh, yeah, so no, right no, no, now, no, 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 don't do that. That's, yeah. that's, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want to start going, you know, in that world, you know. So right. if you can do everything using the DB2 cluster commands, mm -hmm. I mean, this would definitely increase. Uh, I'm sure the uptake. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and there's been a lot of stuff too that we've done, you know, just from the error messages, from the pre-checking, right, yeah. to make sure you've got the right firmware installed if you're using the hardware. Yes. The, um, you know, believe it or not, user-friendly error messages, which is not something we usually do. Um, but uh, all those things have helped, right? Um, and the other thing, too, is that, um, you know, the use of sockets sometimes concerns people because they say, well, isn't there, a hard, isn't there an overhead of doing that? Yes, there is, but there's a lot of enhancements we've done in the PureScale engine to avoid a lot of the unnecessary messaging, right? right. So uh, I'll show a slide a little later on that shows you kind of the scalability of, of using it. Um, you know, PureScale has been out there since 2009, so yeah. it's 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 a hot product. I mean, it's yeah. uh, we see a lot of customers now moving to this. Absolutely. Now, if you are using PureScale, um, one thing that was missing 
was the ability to use HADR in something called synchronous or near synchronous mode. Yes. And then, you know, it used to be async when a lot of customers say, well, that's not very useful because yes. I can't guarantee that the second site will be up to date, right? Exactly. So now you can set up a pure scale cluster, you know, hundreds, right, thousands of kilometers away using sync or near yes. sync. Now, most customers use near sync. That's, that's yeah. good enough, yeah. right? Yeah. But um, so now you can have a local cluster with continuous availability. So if any of the members go down, networking goes down, your cluster continues to run. If the entire site goes down for some reason, you know, a power outage or, you know, blackout of some sort, your second cluster can now be an HADR cluster somewhere else and be running and, and pick up the workloads. Right? Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. And I can see on the slide yep. before you go forward, uh, you also, you know, uh, there's also support now for time delay deploy and log spooling and everything. And all those things are important yeah. in a non-pure scale environment. Sure. So yeah. it's, it's, it's nice that, you know, Again, those have been you know uniformly carried forward to pure scale because you know yeah uh, it's, it's the same kind of issues you have on pure scale. Oh, absolutely, yeah, you know, yeah. If you yeah. you know, it depends on your application, really. Yeah, sorry. If, if people are not aware of it, like log spooling means that there's too much work going on in the secondary, right? I can spool it to to disk, right, yeah. rather than trying to apply it. The other one, time delay. That's where customers say, I want to, de to delay the actual apply of the transaction by five minutes or an hour or whatever. People often wonder why do you do that. And it's for something called logical failures, not physical failures. Logical failure is when somebody on IBM gives everybody a bonus, okay? And, uh, well, absolutely, you know, they're going to say, well, how do I roll that sucker buck, right? Um, you know, had the bonus been zero, that would have been okay. But the thing is that if I do a time delay to apply, apply, what happens is I can go to the secondary server, shut down the primary, and recover the secondary and not, and stop at the point in time where I knew there was an errant transaction. Right. right. So that's why we would use yeah. time delay to apply. Yep. By the way, you can also have three of these secondaries. Okay, so the same thing, the multiple same thing. standbys? Yeah, yeah. some multiple standbys. So the one of them awesome. is your, one of them is your primary secondary, yeah, yeah. which acts as your failover, and that could be sync or near sync or anything. Yes. The other two are super async. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah, so yeah, so they're they're out there just in case you you know. Yeah, the auxiliary, the yeah. auxiliary standbys. Okay. okay. Okay, nice. Uh, so here, the first thing you need to know is we, we made a bunch of performance improvements in pure scale, and this also applies to normal workloads right. okay so we this came out of our pure scale work so it's been it's been backported if you want to call that right to all the db2s yeah and uh, you can see these wonderful numbers here that we get about a 58% improvement in throughput on ese and about a, a, almost twice the improvement in pure scale and these are um, like tpc like transactions you know 80 80% read 20% write type transactions yeah and um, what we did in d internally is that uh, we use uh, an algorithm for buffer pool latching. Basically, it's, it's when somebody needs to get something in memory, needs to update it, we have to prevent other processes or processes or threads or whatever from touching it. You know, that's just, you know, good database design. So that, that whole mechanism on a single core of a uh, processor, Intel processor, we could do about 300,000 of these latches. You know, pick a page, latch it, wait, do something, right? So that sounds like a lot, right? 300,000. The problem is when you've got 1,000 users running simultaneously, yes. each one of them, you know, looking at five or ten pages. And don't forget, you latch index pages, you latch, you know, your, you know that gets chewed up pretty quickly. Yes. Um, so the new algorithm does about, ooh, I don't know, about 60 million, wow. right? So, yeah, it's an incredible uh, reduction in overhead. Uh, so that results in more throughput. Um, so this is something you get no matter what. You'll, you'll only really see this in, in very heavy used workloads. Work but, yeah. you know, that's something that uh, I think is very key for some customers. Absolutely. Now, here's the slide to talk about scaling. Um, so this is using a pure scale cluster. Yeah. The one in uh, dark blue is using RDMA. So this is hardware locking. So we're locking based on, you know, using uh, internal hardware messaging, right, between these a cluster of machines. The, the, the lighter blue one is using sockets. So you can see the scaling from one to four systems is about three times scaling. Um, not bad when you think it's just using uh, software That's or good. sockets, right? That's really good. Uh, and you get more scaling, of course, with RDMA. Yeah. The difference here is that um, you know DB2 does some, some very intelligent um, locking management. Okay, and so when you're looking at a two-node cluster, you shouldn't be worried about using sockets, right? Because there's very little workload going to that second member, right? There's very little locking work going on. Um, yes. So we don't tend to get a lot of communications over the, uh, the sockets. So you can scale very well. Um, so don't be afraid of using sockets for smaller systems. Now, if you're, if you're telling me you've got 100% write 
workload that's locking everything, then RDMA might be a better way. Right. But if you've got these typical 20, you know, 80, 20, 70, 30 type workloads, sockets yeah. is pretty well, pretty good, you know, yeah. up to, like I showed here, four nodes, right? Yeah. Um, if you're going into larger clusters, you know, then you may want to start looking at hardware, you know, yeah. hardware locking. Yes. Right? Yeah. Another thing that we've done, again, is something that uh, you, you, it's just buried into the engine. And this is things we've done to buffer pool management for large batch workloads that come in. And you're running OLTP, and the batch workload says, oh, I'm going to drop a range of data. Right? So uh, you might say, oh, I'm going to delete all of January's sales data while transactions are going on. Right? Or I might drop another big table you know, while I'm refreshing it or something. That impacts your OLTP for a number of reasons. One is the buffer pool management, obviously, plus all these pages get thrown out of the buffer pools and stuff. So we've kind of changed the algorithm so it doesn't impact OLTP as much. Okay. So if you've got these mixed workloads, you know, where you've got the batch running at the same time as OLTP, yeah. you'll see less variation mm. of your OLTP uh, performance. That's very useful. Yeah. All right, now here's another big one, right? And again, we've got a session next week on Blue. Yeah. Um, but what we've done to Blue is we've added uh, MPP scale out. So now you can have a columnar in memory on an MPP cluster. Right? So uh, basically that means I can go and scale to almost any size, depending on how many machines I want to cluster together. Right? So I don't know, Iqbal, you, I mean, have you got customers who are waiting for something like this? Uh, absolutely, George. I mean, you know, I was, you know, we are had, we had talking to a, a, you know, a particular customer, you know, uh, and, and, and trying to set up a POC with them, and this customer is, you know, on, on your normal MPP, yeah. and uh, you know, initially we thought maybe we can bring it to, you know, because Blue is so powerful, and yeah. bring it to uh, just one node and everything. But they had so much uh, uh, OLAP functions and everything embedded in that code that you know it would be difficult right. to 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 bring it to one node. And, and now that we have got Blue. Uh, on MPP, you know, I'm really excited, and we are talking to the customer uh, of, of of doing a POC uh, on that. And I think, I think from what I've heard, uh, again at Austin and and the customer uh, sort of uh, engagements, um, is that every it seems like the blue engine, you know, the, the the blue technology is embedded in the MPP, you know, it's embedded in the engine, right? So when you are passing data from one node to another, it's in columnar format, so you don't have to un you know, undo and redo row to column and everything. Is that, is that correct? Right. Yeah, yeah. So the table queues, for instance, when I yes. move data. Yeah. So, yeah, it has been a lot of work that went into this. People thought it was just, I'm just going to put columnar on each one of these nodes, right? Yeah. But the thing is, when you're moving data between the nodes, you want to keep the same dictionaries. Absolutely. So I'm not, I'm not uncompressing and then recompressing when I move it to another node. So the data is all the same compression. Yeah. Across all the nodes, so that yeah, there was a lot of work done yeah. internally to make this. Yeah. Yeah. You bring up a good point too. Uh, we had a lot of customers who collapsed yes. ETF systems. Yes. The problem is that they may have things like um, scripts and stuff that are built yes. for their MPP system, and to have to rework all of those yes. takes a lot of effort, right? E exactly. That was the yeah. that, that was the you know. So you know, at that time, you know, we, we I knew that you know it's on Dash DB and it's going to be coming on premise and everything. So. We just said, okay, you know, I think it's better to wait for the MPP, Blue One MPP, to come out because the rework and the rewriting of the scripts and the application, there's a lot of application code. And as you know, customers are always, you know, time constrained and all that stuff. So, you know, this is exciting. And I know that lots, many OLAP functions are also there, uh, you know, have been introduced for Blue as well on MPP. So, right. yep. I think, I think absolutely. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really exciting. Actually, and, that's an excellent segue, even though you don't see what the next slide is is the uh, optimized SQL, right? Because yep. we've done a lot with this in MPP because um, if you can imagine, a lot of the stuff people use Blue for are um, you know, analytic queries. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of the analytic queries were not natively implemented in, in, um, in Blue. But what I mean by not natively implemented was that like, Blue would go find the data for you, but then in order to do the calculation, mm. right, the, like the, the range calculation stuff, it would send it to the row part of the DB2 engine, which understood the syntax, right. and it would do that. So think of it as compensation, right? Right. And then once it was done, that it would send it back to the columnar side. Um, so this moving of data back and forth between Blue and the row engine is expensive. Yes. Right. So what we've done is we've taken a lot of those functions and buried them right into the MPP and into the Blue engine. So here's kind of an example. This list kind of summarizes some of them, and and again, I'll talk about them in the SQL session, but. Stuff like um, declare temporary tables, yeah. right, are part of blue. Um, identity expressions, a new code page, by the way, code page 819 for European languages, uh, not logged initially. I don't know why we didn't do that 
when we came up with blue, I mean, you know, it's, it's well, one of the things. I know. Roll and column access control, right? Because yeah. you need security on, yeah. on these things. Uh, merge is faster, so a lot of people use merge, right, to bring new data in. Uh, nested loop join, here's a big one. Yeah. Uh, that particular uh, join algorithm was not available in blue. Okay, you know, so that means we've opened up more optimizations, right, within the blue engine. So this is all good stuff. Right? Sure. So, and many people, you know, you're not going to change your SQL, but you're going to see a big difference in performance because we'll be able to take advantage of some of the new join techniques and some other things, including some brand new sorting as well. So here's a sort. Okay, yep. believe it. I, every, I don't believe these people in research. Some of them spend their lives building sort algorithms, and I didn't think. I thought we already figured out the fastest sorts on Earth, but it appears that we have some more. There's always room uh, for improvement. Yeah. So, so blue sort is uh, in many cases 50, 60, maybe you know, two times faster. Right, and this is true also in the regular DB2. All right, so you'll you'll get this benefit in row or columnar and MPP. So again, you don't have to do anything. It's just that we're taking advantage of these new algorithms for sorting. And when you think about it, almost every OLAP function is a sort. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you know this this is going to help everybody's workload. Now this chart kind of just gives you a quick summary of the performance benefits. Right, so you'll see that this is just on a single instance blue, right? So an SMP system. Yeah. You can see about 36% improvement without doing anything new. All right. So this is just the the new sort algorithm, the push down of the SQL, the you know all the stuff we've done yeah. as improved performance. So this is just by being on version 11. Just in version 11, yeah. Keeping the same configuration, mm -hmm. you'll just see this hidden pleasant surprises. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is all good news for customers. Okay. Um, also, if you look at blue and compare the performance, you'll see that the scaling is really well, scales really, really well in, in an MPP environment. So the first example on the left shows almost a two times scaling going from three nodes to six nodes with the same amount of data. So basically the, the first example had 10 terabytes of data spread across three servers. And then what I did is I made it six servers and the, you know, I still get, I get almost two times throughput, right? So twice the, the processing power, I get twice the throughput. On the right-hand side, what we did is we said three nodes with 10 terabytes, and then we went to six nodes with 20 terabytes. We doubled the data, yeah. and we get the same performance. Okay, so Sweet. the scaling is really well. Notes from my legal team. These results that you see here may not necessarily apply in your situation because these are lab environments, okay? Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm telling you, from what we've seen, generally speaking, you're going to see great scaling with blue on MPP. Okay. Now here is a slide comparing us to one of our competitors on Amazon's web services. Okay, so exactly the same size servers. One is three nodes on Amazon, right? And the other one is DB2 on Amazon again. And you'll notice that we get almost twice the throughput of our competitor. Uh, don't let the red color fool you in any way, all right? But <laughs> <laughs> So, so this is, I think what you just mentioned is interesting. So this is not on Dash DB or SoftClay or something. No, this is on Amazon. That's Amazon, yeah. Amazon, Amazon DB2. Code. DB2. Yeah. On, okay, so that's, that's, I think, I think that's interesting for customers who, you know, who are on, on AWS, really. Yeah. Listen, we'll sell you anywhere a DB2 copy, right? Wonderful. You know, so okay. Dash DB is a managed service, right? Yeah. You know, so we, we do everything for you. You yeah. can also get DB2 on the cloud, which is basically we give you a DB2 installed and you manage it, yeah. right? Or you could do it this way. Just installing one of these DB2 direct licenses somewhere, right? Okay. Yeah, that's it depends on how much work you want to do, right? Yep. Um, now the next one just shows you an example of what happens with the OLAP uh, functions. Uh, it may be hard for you to see this in the slide, but this is one of these complex um, OLAP functions. There's an average over a partition and a, and a ranking over those partitions, and you'll see that the performance is significantly faster. It's about four times faster. But why is it four times faster? And the answer is actually on the next slide, which shows you what's happened in the engine. Okay. The line separates which is the row portion of it and which is the column portion. Right. So you'll notice in version 10.5, a lot of work was done in the row engine, right? Kind of the summarization and the ranking. Right. Whereas now in version 11, we've pushed all of that down into the blue columnar engine. Right. And so the only thing we have to actually do is the data row is to return the results to you in a row format, right? So. You know, fairly significant, right? Performance. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, you can see the CTQ is really moved up the chain, if you wish. Right. And that makes a big difference. Yeah. Uh, that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Now, 
SQL, all right? Yeah. Um, we got a session on this in three yeah. weeks, I guess. Absolutely. And, and uh, there's, we're one of the leading vendors in the industry for producing SQL nobody knows or understands. Um, and we've added some more in this release. Uh, you can see that I've kind of given you highlights of it because yeah. there's just so many of them. Yeah. All right. I'm going to show you a couple of the neat SQL enhancements. Okay. A lot of it is for compatibility. Yes. Um, you'll see uh, also new data types coming out. So a new binary data type. Um, that'll thrill a lot of people on the phone, I'm sure. You can now say, you know, binary ten. So you got ten bytes in a field. Right. right, right. Um, yeah. There's also data types that are um, inherited from the TISA. So kind of you know similar data types. Um, some functions also for compatibility. So let me show you a couple of them that I think are really interesting, okay? okay. First one's create table uh, with a select statement. Um, now, many of you know you could create a table like, right? Yes. Yeah, that was the syntax that said I want to create a table like. Now you can say create a table as, and yes. you give it a select statement. And we will build that table based on the contents of the select statement. Oh, that's nice. And there's two options. One is with data, and one is called definition only. When you say definition only, will create the table definition with the list of columns that you've selected. Yes. And what with data will do is actually load your table for you at the same time. So this is actually really neat because for those people who want to do quick prototyping, you say, you know, create table as, and a very complex select statement could be in there. Right. Right. Um, now, this, the insert, this is an insert under the covers. Okay. Right? So this is a billion row table. That was Somebody's going to kill you, right? That was my question. Yeah, I know. So, no, but, but, yeah, yeah. What does it do? So if yeah. it doesn't insert, it's good for small, you know, quick. Well, uh, okay. But what, uh, my suggestion would be create table, right? Yeah. As select with definition only. Yes. Okay. And then you do load into the table. Makes sense. Right? Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Or, or ingest or whatever. Yes. Right? Works. Yeah, yeah. But again, this is a nice quick syntax right, nice. for doing things. Absolutely. Um, the next one is offset with fetch first, and I'm probably wonder why I want to do an offset. This is the ability to say, I'm going to do an answer set, and what I want you to do is skip the first 10 records. So I can say offset 10 rows right. and before I start reading. And where this is useful is if I've written an application where I want to quickly disconnect from the database, I don't want to keep a cursor open. Okay, so as you know, when you do a select, you know you can create a, a, a fetch a cursor. Yes. Right? Um, here what you may want to do is you say, um, Select the first 10 rows. So I select asterisk from employee, um, offset one, fetch 10 rows only. So that gives me a block of 10. Yeah. And the person says scroll down. Now I can say select asterisk from employee, offset 10, fetch first 10. So now what I've done is I've moved 10 down in the answer set and give you the next 10. Okay. Okay. That's one possible way of using it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's new in this okay. this release. Um, if people like creating their own functions, you know, we can do, uh, you, you know, scalar functions, yes. right? We can create table functions. Yeah. Um, we could create aggregation functions, but only as synonyms for other functions. In this release, we can actually create our own function that does aggregation. Uh, so let's say, example, you want to create a transcendental meditation function, right? I don't know what it actually does for you, but, <laughs> but, but what it does is every time that a new row is in your cursor, a new row would be given to your function. You do kind of initiation stage, which you set you know values to zero or whatever, or you and then accumulate. Maybe you count the number of rows, or you sum something, or average something, and then merge is when you have a DPF system where you merge results from various nodes, and then you finalize by giving a result back. So you can create these very complex aggregation functions. Okay, that's just really cool. Okay, the other thing too is that for anybody who's got Netiza workloads, mm -hmm. we can actually take some of the SQL from Netiza now and run them on DB2. Okay. And the way you do that is, is this new compatibility setting. Okay. It's done right in the SQL. You can say set compatibility. Oh, in the MPS. SQL itself. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to do it at a database level. It's all at the SQL level. Okay. So dynamically, you can change the behavior of DB2. Okay. Um, so you can use some of these strange uh, symbols that Natiza understands. Uh, you know, one of these in here, I wish we would have done for native DB2, and that's called grouping by select clause columns. If anybody's written a select statement that says, you know, select, um, let's say, select department number, um, some salary, right, from employee, and then you do group by department, yeah, right? Yeah. The thing is, you have to always group by the name of the column. Yes. This allows you to say group by one. Mm. You know the column number, and instead of having to do the actual calculation in the group by, you could do a column number, right? Which yeah. is, makes it a lot easier. We can do that with order by, but we can't do it with group by. Right. Uh, Netiza syntax allows you to do that, um, but DB2 doesn't. Right? So for the one time you want to write it, you can say set SQL compatible MPS, <laughs> use the syntax, and then say set equal to DB2, and yeah. it, you know, it's, 
That's good. I don't know. <laughs> Whoever wrote this should have just made it to DB2, whatever. Here's another good one, by the way. Anybody remember Oracle compatibility? The plus sign is used as an outer join. You know, because DB2 general syntax is like outer join table, right? Yes. Well, guess what? The plus sign now is an alternative for outer join, and you don't even have to set on Oracle compatibility in this release. Believe it or not. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, there are billions of programs out there that use a plus sign for outer join. Okay, so here's the version 11 highlights. Okay, we've taken you just through some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, the key things were the packaging's changed. So you need to know that if you're on Express, you're going to get Workgroup, right? Workgroup comes down in price, but now we're adding a whole bunch of stuff, right? We're adding encryption, yeah. a pure scale with a secondary, you know, standby node for maintenance. Um, Federation's now in there, yeah. right? We've got um, all sorts of new stuff for Blue and MPP, push down of the SQL for better performance. Okay, pure scale now, it's got a lot of ease of use stuff in it, some virtualization, which I'll cover when we talk about pure scale, right? And tons of SQL, right? Uh, like I said, stuff that uh, many of you will find very interesting. Um, in fact, if you like something called um, regular expressions, yes. DB2 now supports regular expression searching in your text strings. So that's, that's a really powerful piece of SQL. Um, so again, that's something that you'll have to wait for in our SQL session. So we're not going to let you get away without having to listen to at least one more of our recordings, <laughs> right? You know, so oh, sorry, any any sorry, final words, Iqbal? Yes, I mean, I think I think this was quite quite a lot of information here, really, in, in the overview. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm excited, really, uh, to, 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 to tune into the next three sessions because I'm sure everyone, you know, the, P, the blue MPP and then the pure scale and the SQL you talked about and the regular expressions and everything, I think there's going to be, you know, something for everybody. Uh, so um, I, I, I really recommend everyone who is listening to tune in to our, you know, next uh, uh, three sessions. You know, we have kept them on the same day at the same time so that you can plan them, uh, make, make the planning easy for you guys. And um, if there's any questions, you know, we've got a few minutes uh, left for questions. If you can, you know, if, if you want to type your questions, that's fine. But uh, in, in the meantime, I'll, I'll say a big thank you to George. Uh, for, 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 for being here with me and actually, you know, in London. So it's really nice uh, of him to do so and really excited uh, for next week. So thank you, George. Yeah, thanks a lot, Iqbal. And thanks for, again, inviting me to do the talks. And, and it's nice to talk about something that isn't in the cloud, you know, for, for a change. Um, you know, but uh, anyways, with that, let me uh, return it back to Jillian, who will uh, close up the, uh, the seminar. Okay, that's great. Thanks, George. Thanks, Iqbal, for uh, an entertaining and informative seminar. So uh, just a quick reminder, we've got three more sessions. Um, we'll be sending out reminders of these at close to the time. Uh, but on Tuesday, June the 7th, same time, same place, we've got uh, DB2 for LEW 11.1 Blue Enhancements. Uh, the following Tuesday on the 14th, we've got a pure scale session, specifically looking at some of the pure scale features that George and Nick Bell touched upon in that uh, last uh, uh, session. And then finally, on June the 21st, we're going to have a focus on SQL and looking specifically at some of the new features and syntax that makes it easier to port SQL from other platforms. So uh, those three are all coming up. There will be reminders for those of you that have uh, registered. Um, and uh, with that, as there are no more questions, I think we'll close the session there and look forward to seeing and hearing from you all uh, this time next week. Thanks very much.